Welcome to our February edition of Global View. For those who are new to Frontier View, we are part of Fiscanos Global Intelligence Business Unit. At Frontier View, we work as trusted partner um, for over 300 multinationals supporting senior executives such as VPs of regions, CFOs, and strategy leads. Our focus is empowering strategic planning, market monitoring, and international growth. And for that, we have dedicated research practices for North America, Latin America, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, Asia Pacific Global Economics and Healthcare. We work with clients across consumer goods, healthcare, B2B, and the tech sectors. And today we have a true um, global topic to discuss, but one that is deeply rooted in our regional knowledge as well. And I have the best person for this conversation, Mansour El Zahab, joining me today, uh, who leads our uh, Middle East, North Africa research practice. Mansour, welcome. I think uh, our Thanks. listeners can probably guess what we're about to talk about, which is, of course, the, um, the situation in the Middle East and the tensions that we're seeing there. Um, and, uh, of course, how that relates to global shipping disruptions and uh, spilling over into the global economy. So lots for us to go through. But, Mansoor, I'm going to ask you probably the most difficult question uh, right now, uh, which is um, what would need to happen for us to move towards a sustainable ceasefire or some sort of negotiated solution, given current tensions between Israel and Hamas and across the Middle East region? And do you see any risk of potential further escalation? That is definitely a very, very difficult question, uh, both to kind of draw out what the rational exit would be from this conflict and also just how difficult it is to actually achieve some of these requirements. But really, if we can summarize them, there would be three um, major ways or kind of most important ways uh, that could allow us an exit from this conflict. One of them being um, kind of if we look internally a little bit, Prime Minister Netanyahu has to be kicked out of the government. Uh, and a general election has to take place, whereby we see a, a more centrist government taking place, removing some of those far right uh, representation and kind of bringing back rationale to have a more open dialogue towards what would the future be for this conflict. Uh, a second potential uh, exit for this would be perhaps uh, a situation whereby we see a Democrat win uh, for uh, the upcoming US elections becoming very difficult. So imagine this could potentially start to put a lot of pressure on the Biden administration to get a sustainable foreign policy win uh, and essentially improve voter engagement from some of the minorities, particular, particularly Arab uh, and Muslim minorities in, in the U.S. That could start to bring a lot more urgency to the conversation and, and put a lot more pressure on Nottingham's government uh, towards a ceasefire. Or potentially, if we do see a breakthrough in the uh, Saudi-US discussions where um, we start to see a more comprehensive, realistic situation uh, offering a package, a kind of a comprehensive package of a solution, which would include a Palestinian statehood, normalization between Saudi uh, and the Israelis, and also, very importantly, Hamas uh, demilitarization and a more political diplomatic approach to the future. Uh, the last one would probably the most rounded and you can kind of afford some form of incentives to all parties. But as it stands right now, we're quite far from a breakthrough. So it is, a, it, it is in fact, a little bit difficult to imagine. Um, and actually, on, on, on the note of your question, I would say, yeah, there are, there are more risks uh, that we're watching today in the situation, in the conflict of the uh, war on Gaza, which is essentially... The situation with Lebanon is getting a little bit more tense. Um, there is always room for a rise in tension and a breakout into a complete war between uh, the Israelis and the Lebanese, particularly with Hezbollah. And that will remain to be the case and actually will continue to climb as well. Uh, further to that, we're seeing tensions with Iran continuing to climb. Something has to give and without a comprehensive diplomatic solution, uh, Iran might continue to apply some form of pressure but we're uh, living on very, very fine lines right now. So any wrong move could potentially drag the entire uh, region into a, a wider spread conflict. So Iran and Lebanon are the two main sources of, of more escalatory risks that we are monitoring. Got it. Thank you, Mansoor. So I think that probably tells us something about the uh, risks to shipping, which is 
the main way in which the global economy has been affected so far. Uh, obviously, lots more risk playing out at the more regional level, but uh, we've seen significant disruption to shipping across the Red Sea, impact on the Suez Canal, and then impact ultimately on global shipping prices. Based on everything you've shared so far, it sounds like we're not going to see uh, really an improvement in this situation for at least a few months. Is that a fair statement to make? It is indeed. So uh, our expectations were communicating with many multinationals out there that essentially we see the same current situation dragging all the way until April. As mm -hmm. things stand, of course, things can always get worse and we hope that it doesn't, of course. Um, but even after that, when we're thinking about risks and we're starting to think about disruptions, well, disruptions will last until April and maybe add another month as a buffer. It, for confidence to come back through the Red Sea, you have to see about a month of uh, essentially very calm waters, uh, uh, absence of any risk of uh, essentially rockets being launched. So we're looking to at least maybe April, May, when we're thinking of some of the cost burdens. And we have to remember that actually economies around the, the region and multinationals operating have been facing a lot of cost pressures, a lot of mm -hmm. economic pressures in some of the markets. That will drag on to across most of 2024, unfortunately, until we see a diplomatic solution and the end of the war on Gaza, everything that's been happening. There is always going to be a risk that one um, mistake or, or one stretch of a move could drag us back into a very tense situation. So on the cost front, risk premiums will remain relatively high through 2024. Yeah, and, and this is a conversation we're having with clients because... Um, how long this lasts for has implications mm. for what they need to do on pricing, how they absorb those costs, or maybe they pass them on to customers and what that does to their overall pricing strategy for 2024, especially if they have big dependence on some of these routes, especially between uh, China and Europe. So uh, we went into the year with a certain set of assumptions around inflation, but it's way more complicated by that than that. And of course, a lot of it is political in, in nature. Um, here we can see some of the data across uh, price increases for shipping that clients and companies globally have been dealing with. Um, Mansoor, so based on everything you've shared so far, um, what are you hearing from clients in the Middle East, specifically whose business has been most directly affected by this? Um, where is the biggest impact on them and what are they most concerned about? Mm. So when we're speaking to clients in the region, mostly some of the more concerning conversations that we had at the close of last year and the opening of this year was more about kind of resetting assumptions, uh, looking at some of the performance targets that multinationals had previously set maybe all the way back in September before any of this started. Uh, there were maybe more hopes for a few markets to drive a lot more growth, but of course we've had to revise some of these assumptions and naturally it comes uh, closest towards the ring of fire, as it's called, or, or where the conflict is mostly uh, tense. And here we're speaking about, for example, the Palestinian market, um, the Lebanese market, the Jordanian, Israeli, the Egyptian market have all seen a significant downwards revision to some of the performances and the ambitions of maybe some investments that multinationals would have wanted to undertake. Uh, there's an array of um, of kind of factors that and assumptions that we're rebuilding into our adjusted performance uh I suppose targets for 2024, those include um, much weaker demand, uh, supply chain disruptions, uh, as you know, we spoke about the, the situation in the Red Sea, uh, much higher receivable risks uh, also across, uh, across particularly in Egypt and Jordan and Lebanon, and of course in, in Palestine as well, where uh, there's a complete collapse of the financial system right now because of the, uh, of the ongoing war. But when we're thinking of outside of the, those um, kind of aforementioned markets, there is still quite a bit of concern. So actually, multinationals are struggling with reputational risk, which is something that uh, we spend quite a lot of time discussing with, with various multinationals. It's important for us to note that actually our view for boycotting activities will remain very resilient. We're not seeing any immediate signs of any slowing down. Um, the nature of the war, the severity of the casualties, you know, 26,000 uh, killed uh, in, in, in Gaza so far, all of that has had a very, very strong emotional, very pronounced impact on how consumers behave and the consumer dynamics, for example, uh, in the region. So that has impacted how um, you know businesses and consumers have been 
changing maybe some of their purchasing activity. Um, and that has been one of the key risks for uh, a few Western multinationals in the region. Unfortunately, uh, for them, this is not going to change. And, and uh, in turn, we're seeing some changes and in, internal changes for multinationals that are looking at, okay, how do we use marketing to get closer to the consumers in, in, the, in the Middle Eastern market? How do we show them that we are closer to, to the culture there? Uh, but that risk, the boycotting risk, is something that will remain with us. Uh, outside of that, I would say the loss of confidence, um, it's it's really more towards that actually confidence is even outside of, of the, you know, Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, uh, Israel, uh, we are still seeing quite frail confidence. So when we're looking at some SMEs, there, there is still maybe some uh, reluctance to undertake some investments that they had previously had set their ambitions for in 2024. All of that starts to create a more cautious environment in the market that is likely to last until at least maybe September before that confidence starts to resume because there is always that nagging concern. What happens if the war expands? Uh, so we're also seeing a little bit of caution when it comes to uh, private investments and that is likely to continue through. So these, these would be the most pressing concerns for multinationals in the region, I would say. Thank you, Mr. And very last and very short question. Um, does this also mean that there's an even greater dependence on performing in Saudi now? Precisely. So actually, what I forgot to mention in that uh, is you, there, are, there are two markets with a little bit more immunity. Mm -hmm. Those are Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Uh, naturally, due to the size of the economy and, and just how much strength uh, the public sector has into driving and stimulating further economic growth, despite what is happening around the region. So yes, there will be more reliance uh, on extracting those uh, performances in, in Saudi, in the UAE, and also actually um, a peripheral market that is becoming or gaining a lot more uh, attention, or a couple of them actually, would be Morocco and Oman as well. So these two markets are standing out as potentially supportive of maybe let's try to, to make up for some lost performances elsewhere in, in, in Oman and, and in Morocco. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mansoor, and thank you everybody for joining us for this edition of Global View. Uh, lots more for us to discuss, but uh, for today, we wish you goodbye and look forward to seeing you again next month. Thank you.